I discovered Polly Murray in the 1970s, uh, reading some of her essays in the collections of feminist writings that were being published in those years, and in getting to know Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the first female professor at Columbia Law School when I was a new assistant professor of history at, at Columbia. And being interested in the 14th Amendment, uh, I learned from Ruth Bader Ginsburg the importance of Polly Murray to extending the rights of women uh, through her own work. I started working on this uh, life of Polly Murray as a biography in the 1990s. I had originally intended to write a book on the 14th Amendment, but when Polly Murray's papers were opened at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, I realized that there was a, a rich story to be told uh, about her life, and both her public and her private life, as a way of understanding the 14th Amendment and how it evolved over many decades. The, the primary influence on me in writing this biography was Polly Murray's own work. She, uh, the last two years of her life, she uh, wrote a, a memoir which she began to call Jane Crow, but after her death, her editors named Song in a Weary Throat, which was taken from one of her poems. And Polly Murray was not only a civil rights activist and feminist and lawyer, she was also a, a poet and a priest. Uh, but reading that memoir uh, made me realize how many different parts of 20th century American history uh, could be illuminated by telling her uh, her life. But I also believed that there were parts of her life she was not touching at all, because the, the memoir, wonderful as it is, is, is not as deeply reflective as the first family history that she wrote back in the 1950s, uh, principally about her, her grandparents. There was something that she was hiding, and it wasn't until I uh, got deep into her papers that I realized that what she was hiding were her personal struggles, her private struggles over gender identity. My thinking about Murray did change over the course of the, the project. Uh, when I first began to read her papers, and this was about 1997, uh, I came across medical papers that she had very carefully saved. And at first I thought that she was saying that her principal struggle was with sexual orientation, that she, she was a lesbian at a time when it was very difficult to be open about one's sexual orientation. But as I kept going back and reading again, and as I read further, I realized that she didn't think of herself as a lesbian. She thought of herself as a heterosexual male in a female body. And that added a layer of complexity to her, her, to her, her life that I thought was very important because as hard as it was to be a lesbian in the 1930s and 40s, it was uh, much more difficult to be what we would now call someone struggling with a transgender identity because the term didn't exist. Uh, no social movement existed to support her. The, the most that she could look to was the writings on sex, sexology that uh, were printed in the early part of the 20th century. And her favorite author was Havelock Ellis, who argued that there were some people who were pseudo-hermaphrodites people who had the external characteristics of one sex but the internal characteristics of another. And she was convinced that that was who, who she was. <laughs>